Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. So does the idea of going on a missions trip excite you or scare you? How many people in the room would love the opportunity to go on a missions trip? Okay, cool. You will have that opportunity. We're going to the Dominican Republic late 2022 uh, with new missions. How many of you in here today, the idea of going on a mission trip scares you? Come on, don't lie. There's somebody in here. All right, a couple of you. Yeah, me too. I don't like them. I like it. I've done it. I've gone on a mission trip, went there, did that, done that. Um, I went on like five or six throughout my life. I went to Hi- IAT. Anybody from Haiti? Haiti? Any Haitians? All right. I went to, I went to IAT. <laughs> IAT pour Jay-Z. You speak Creole? French. Oh, French and Creole? Yeah. So uh, we did the March for Jesus in Haiti. And the night before the March for Jesus, the, a group of people surrounded our camp where we were at, and they did, like, voodoo and stuff, and, like, crucified an animal, and, like, yo, I was bugged out! <laughs> I was so scared that I had to, like, use the bathroom, but I would not get out of bed. <laughs> I, w- I wouldn't get out of bed to go across the room to use the toilet on the other side. I, w- I was that scared. I just tell you, it just wasn't my thing. There's people who like it, get excited about that kind of stuff, you know, and they, and they enjoy that sort of thing. It just wasn't for me, okay? Now, and I get both sides. So when we start talking about missions, going on a missions trip, there's a difference between going on a missions trip and being called to be a missionary. Who in here would love the opportunity to sell everything they own, move to another country and be a missionary? One. Two, three, four. Well, you see, I like air conditioning. <laughs> I like electricity. Yeah, yeah. I like the basic essentials of life, yeah. right? And, and sometimes when you're called, when you have that calling, it means something, right? It means something. It means a sacrifice that's going to be made to go do something like that. And so today I want to talk about missions, all right? This whole month we're going to be talking about missions, both near and far, near and far, life on mission, life on mission. The, the number one Bible verse that really talks about missions and talks about what our call to do as a Christian is found in Matthew 28, 18, and it's called the Great Commission. Can everyone say the Great Commission? Right, the Great Commission. Do you know what it's not called? The Great Suggestion. It could also be called the Great Commandment. A command, a commission. Something that we are supposed to do because we are believers in Jesus Christ. You ready? Let's break it down. In Matthew 20, 18, it says, Then Jesus said, who said? Jesus! Jesus! This is God. God made man on earth, Right? He's saying this to us, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given unto me. So Jesus has received all authority on heaven and earth, and then he says this, so go, he's giving it to us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. What is he teaching them? Everything. I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. We're going to dissect this passage. This is going to be more of a boring sermon, okay? It's not going to be as exciting. I'm not going to have some big revelation and go running around the building today, uh, because we, we're going to dissect this word by word. We're going to have a little English lesson. Is that okay today? And I'm going to try to take a really nerdy topic and make it simple to understand. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. So the, I got a problem with this passage. The first problem I have, it says, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth, therefore go. Go where? Go where? 
I mean, at least in Acts 1.8, it says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be disciples in both Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the othermost parts of the earth. At least you've given me some information. This just says, all authority has been given unto me, so go. So are we supposed to just go anywhere, anytime, any place? Because that could get pretty expensive. I got I to gotta tell you, like, I got invited to go preach in India like every week. It's mostly spam. <laughs> and they most likely want to rob me and kill me. But I get invites all the time on Facebook, right? Am I supposed to just go? Am I supposed to just go? I mean, because I think that's what stops a lot of people. Do I have to sell my car and my house and quit my job and just go? Was that what I signed up for as being a Christian? Because after all, it's the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. And I think that there's a lot of people not going because they don't know where to go, how to go, and how much it's gonna cost them. So I wanna break this down today. There's a difference between evangelism and missions. Okay, there's a difference between evangelism and missions. Evangelism is speaking to anyone, anywhere about the gospel. Anyone, anywhere about the gospel. You don't even have to succeed at it. Like a lot of evangelists are like weathermen. They're horrible at it. <laughs> no, that wasn't a good joke. Like in the church world, like evangelists have jokes against pastors and then against apostles. Like just, it's one of those things. Like really to be an evangelist, you don't even have to be good at it. You just have to do it. You just have to evangelize. Just tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tell them that God is good. Evangelism happens when anybody, somebody, tells someone else about Jesus. You can even evangelize in churches to people who are already Christians because they may not have the full truth of the gospel and you're presenting a gospel message to believers. It's still evangelism. That's why churches do bring in evangelists and they do evangelist services, right? Have you heard of this? Okay. So sharing the gospel to anyone, your mom or dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, is evangelism. Missions is a little bit different. Missions is doing that same thing cross-culture. Cross-culture. Someone who has a different cultural background than you. Maybe as someone who speaks a different language than you. Right, so then when you see people do missions work, like if I'm gonna go to the DR, I do not speak Espanol natively, I would have to have a translator or my wife with me to translate for me. We, we went on a trip to, to the Dominican Republic, uh, a resort there, and like, I can get by. I'm, I'm not gonna die. Like, I can get food, la comida, <laughs> agua, el baño, you know what I'm saying? I, can, I got the essentials down. But to really have like an interactive conversation to like present the gospel, I would need a translator because it's cross culture for me to do that. So evangelism is anywhere, anytime. Missions is doing the exact same thing but cross culture. Now, that doesn't mean that I have to go to another country to speak to somebody cross culture, okay? We're talking about evangelism, both near and far. Today, I mean missions, both near and far. Today, I wanna take that passage in Matthew 28, and I wanna break it down. Way, way break it down, is that okay? Amen. Okay, go ahead and put that verse up on the screen in the Greek language. Somebody go ahead and read that for me. It's all Greek to me, right? I have no idea what that's saying. That's, that is the Greek language. Uh, wording, lettering, layout of this passage. Notice that I have four words underlined. Four words are underlined. And I'm going to do my best to give you an English lesson on the Greek language to understand what this passage is actually saying to us, okay? The first is this. In this sentence, there is a word in this sentence that's what's called the imperative verb. Imperative verb, anybody know what that means? Anybody English student, an imperative verb, right? 
An imperative word is a singular word, a singular word that demands action. It's a singular word that as it stands alone is a complete sentence, right? So can someone just shout out an imperative word to me? Go, run, jump. If you're a golfer, four. <laughs> it's an imperative word. It is a singular word that standalone gives you all the information that you need. Eat, fight, run. There's one of those in this sentence, in this passage. But there are three participles. Anybody know what a participle is? In the English language, a participle is a word ending in ing. Swimming, fighting, running, jumping, going. That's a participle. So there's one word in this passage that is, I know, I'm sorry that this is boring. There's one word that is an imperative verb, and there are three words that are participles, okay? So I want to break this down for you so you can really, really get it. What we have to understand, here's the key. Put this up on the screen. Whichever word is the imperative verb, that is the word that is telling you what to do. Whatever word is the imperative verb, it is the word that is telling you what to do. Whichever words are the participles are telling you how to do it. Did, did you follow me? All right. The imperative verb is telling you what to do. The participles are telling you how to do it. Ready? I'm gonna give you an example. Taking out the trash, sweeping the floors, wiping down the countertops, clean the kitchen. Clean the kitchen, clean, is the imperative verb, clean. How do I clean? Taking out the trash, sweeping the floors, wiping down the countertops. Did you get that? Yes. Are, we, are you following me? Everybody follow me all on the same page? Okay. Clean is the imperative verb, the participles, taking, sweeping, wiping. Ready, here we go, change this up. Tune your car. How do I tune the car? Changing the oil, checking the spark plugs, replacing the distributor cap. The imperative is tune, and we're going to do that by changing the oil, checking the plugs, replacing the distributor cap. Got that? Okay. So, in the Greek language, a participle does not end with ing, because that would be English lettering. It ends with o-n-t-e-s, ontes, or entes, depending on, um, like, um, o or a in the English uh, Spanish language, like how it would end, antes or entes, dep depending on gender or how it's being said. So antes or entes is what we would use as ing. And there are three words in this passage that are ending in either antes or entes, and they're these. Ready? Now, this is gonna mess you up. This is gonna mess you up because this totally radically changes the definition of this passage. Are you ready? Here's the participles, ready? Going, baptizing, and teaching. Going, baptizing, and teaching. Which means the definition of this passage is not to go. Going is how we do what we're called to do in this passage. Are, are we getting that? Like, I don't want to confuse you. Because normally, we look at this as go. Discipling, baptizing, teaching. But that's not what this passage is saying. This passage is saying going, disciple, baptizing, teaching. What are we supposed to do? Disciple. How are we supposed to disciple? Going, baptizing, teaching. Whoa, 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 whoa. This changes the whole thing. Because I was taught just go. Go. Make disciples. Baptize. Teach. But listen, you don't make a disciple like you make a sandwich. That's not what this is saying. It's almost kind of like a bad translation trying to put this in English. 
really what this passage is saying is going, disciple all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. Going, disciple, baptizing, and teaching. Now, that may not really make any sense at all, but disciple in this sentence is the imperative verb, and there's no noun at all in this text. There's only one single imperative verb, there's only one command, only one action word in the Greek, and it's the word disciple. Disciple. Let me ask you this. Do you feel that you have someone in your life that you are discipling? And I would say that that is probably the issue with Christianity today. It's probably the issue with Christianity today. Is that we feel like a lot of times we get saved, we become a Christian, and we're lifelong disciples. Keep teaching us, Pastor Mike. I'm gonna keep coming back every Sunday. You teach us, you teach us, you teach us. Where really, we're all commissioned to take what we know and tell somebody else. Let's break this down. Let's break this down. Let's look at these three participles because these three participles are gonna tell us how we disciple. We know that we're supposed to disciple, but how do I disciple? How do I disciple? Because Pastor Mike, I don't have a, you know, a degree from a seminary about how to do this. I don't know the Bible like you. That's not what this is saying. This doesn't mean, this has nothing to do with how much knowledge you have about Christianity. None at all. Ready? Let's look at the first participle. The first participle is the word going. Going. Going, disciple all nations. Here's the idea. The word going here is not the idea of go on a missions trip. Go somewhere else. Go to another land. That's not what this is saying. This, this is saying, this word here, going, this participle, conveys a continuous action that is already happening right now and will continue to happen throughout the future. Okay? So where do you go weekly now? Where are you going after church? Where are you going Monday morning? Where are you going after work on Monday? Do you go to the gym? Do you go to the coffee shop? You go to work? There's a bunch of employees, friends, community. This word means you're already going. You're already going to the world. So as you're going, <laughs> disciple. On your going, disciple. As you're going throughout life, disciple. You're already going. You're already at the coffee shop. You're already at the gym. You're already in different places. You go to the gun club or you go to a sewing club or a book club. As you're going, disciple. Disciple. But how do I disciple? You see, the Great Commission is not a verbal command to go. It's a command to disciple as you are already going. As you're already going. You are a disciple, and you are to disciple wherever you go. Jesus said you are the light of the world. You're the light. You carry the light. You are always the light. Even if you don't want to be seen, you're the light. Why is everybody picking on me? Because you're light. As soon as you walked in the room, you lit it up. Right. That's why people picking on you, right? You're the light. So as you're going, disciple. Go where? Everywhere. Wherever you go, you are a disciple. That means that the Great Commission is not about going on trips to evangelize to people who speak different languages, although that is a legitimate thing to do. The going in the Great Commission is best understood as the fact that's taken for granted, I think, a lot of times is while you're going through your daily routine, disciple. Amen. There are people, can, can, can you connect with me for like two seconds on this? There are people that you are in connection with that I will never meet in my lifetime. 
you have a circle of influence that I will never touch. Those are, that's where you are called to disciple. The people that I cannot reach and I don't have to reach them. I'm not supposed to reach them. That's you. That's your purpose. That's your calling. That's why God trusted you with that circle of influence. This means that every single person can participate in the Great Commission because it's not about knowing what mission trip to go on. It's about what you do every single day. So then he goes on to say this. Uh, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptizing. Now, I know that when we hear this word baptizing, we immediately think that we need to go dunk people in water. Okay? Here at Family Church, we believe in three baptisms. The first baptism is the baptism into the name of Jesus. That is salvation. Okay? Salvation. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10, 9, and 10 tells us that if you have believed in your heart and confessed with the mouth of the Lord Jesus, then you shall be saved. Okay? That's the baptism into the name of Jesus. Then we take it to the next step, which is the baptism of water, which is your public confession of an inward work. Now, here's the deal. You don't need a pastor to baptize you. You don't need a pastor to baptize you. I know a lot of times we do because we want that. We want it to be a little bit sacred, holy, whatever. But don't, yo, these dudes took people down to like the river, dirty river, not even like chlorinated water. And they baptize them in these dirty rivers. It, it wasn't a matter of having a holy man do it. If there's someone in your life that you look up to, you say, hey, would you, could you baptize me? Bam, it can be done in your swimming pool. Come on, somebody baptize you in your bathtub. It's a public confession of an inward work. And then there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is telling us to go and baptize. What he's saying is bring others to a commitment to Christ. Let me ask this question today. Don't shout anything out. Just meditate upon this. Why are you here at church today? Why are you here? You could be getting ready for football. Right? I could be at a friend's wedding. Why are we here today? Why do we keep coming back? What brought your butt to sit in this seat? Tell that story. Tell that story. Tell someone else. I mean, dude, you don't got to know the Bible. Tell somebody your why. Tell somebody your why. Why do you decide to get up early on a Sunday and go to church? Why? Simply put, that will bring somebody to say, man, I'd like, I'd like to check out that church. Bring someone to a place that they can be baptized into the name of Jesus. Now, the third participle might be a little bit harder. Third participle might be a little bit harder. He says, teaching them, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Okay, so there's two big ideas here, ready? He says, teach them everything I taught you. I don't even know what Jesus taught them. I mean, we gotta go to the Beatitudes. We gotta go to the Sermon on the Mount. We gotta go to every single teaching that Jesus taught. And, and, and teach somebody else what he taught. So, so now I feel, I feel uneducated. I feel uneducated because I don't know what I would teach somebody. Okay, so then maybe we could do by the second part. So maybe you don't know all the things that Jesus taught, but he says this, teach them to obey. Teach them to obey. And here's a struggle. We don't want to obey. We don't really want to obey everything that Jesus said. Huh? Do we? If what you're going to say is going to offend somebody, don't say it. Ooh, I wouldn't have nothing to post on social media. <laughs> huh? If your hand caused you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye calls you, don't pluck it out. I ain't doing that. 
I like 2020. I'm just saying, I'm just throwing some stuff out here, right? Come on, somebody. Do you know how people learn to obey? They, people don't learn to obey the Bible by reading the Bible. People learn to obey by reading Christians. People don't learn to obey by what you say. They learn to obey by what you do. So like I was raised, don't do what I say, do what I, no, don't do what I do, do what I say. That don't work, bro. Never did. I'm gonna do exactly what I saw you do. And your addiction is gonna end up being my addiction. And whatever you're doing at home and the words that you speak at home, you're gonna raise the exact same kids as you. And so what the scripture is saying is, put on Christianity, put on the faith suit, and allow others to mimic the life that you are leading in Christ. That's really what this great commission is about. It's not about the going. It's about discipleship. It's about discipleship. We are to uh, receive and learn about Christianity, and we are to create others just like that. All right, but Pastor Mike, what about that part where it says, go to the nations, go to the world? So the Greek word for world is the word cosmos. Heard that before? Cosmos is the, is the Greek word for world. And the word for earth is the word G-H-A-Y-S, gays. But here in Matthew, he's not using either one of those words. He's not using the word for world or the word for earth. He's using the word here uh, in the Greek called ethne. Ethne, E-T-H-N-A-Y. What does that sound like? Ethnicity, ethnicity, right, ethne. And it's translated all the way down. He's speaking to Jewish people and he's saying, you Jewish people, go to the Gentiles. Jews, go to the Gentiles. Ethne, someone of your different ethnicity. Go to those who don't have access to Christ. Jewish Christians were supposed to go outside of their ethnicity and share Jesus with the world. They were not to keep the good news to themselves. The good news about Jesus is for all ethnicities, every kind of human being in the world. It has nothing to do with traveling to foreign countries, though that is fine, and, and I believe that that should be part of the Christian life. I'll tell you right now, I believe every Christian should go on a mission trip, whether it scares them or not. And you should go where you're actually doing missions work, not staying in a really nice hotel, where you're actually out there feeding and, and sharing the gospel and seeing what it's like in a country that is destitute and desolate. I mean, when you're out feeding children who live in a garbage dump, it does something to you. It does something to you when you're on a mission trip and you empty your suitcase and don't bring any of your clothes home because you are, you are clothing the naked. There's something about flying back into your country where there's all these lights on that we take electricity for granted and waste it because you were a week in a country that had none. It does something to you. And I believe that every single one of us should do that. But there are people on your own street who have not heard the gospel message. Would we even notice that someone was in need? Do we have the eyes both near and far? See, it's real easy to take $5 and put it in an offering plate for global missions. That's real easy to do. But taking a weekend to serve at a soup kitchen when the lawn has to be mowed, it's a little bit extra work. When the house isn't clean yet, when I gotta make sure the kid's homework is done. See, it's real easy to get distracted from what's happening right here in our own places. Living life on mission, both near and far. You're already going through life. You're already going through life. I'm just asking you today, can you, as you're going, disciple by baptizing and teaching?
Can I tell you this? This isn't my job. That, that's not my job. This didn't say pastors do this. My job is to edify, build up, and exhort the body of Christ. That's my job. My job is to point direction and give vision so that we can all mobilize and go toward it. Global church's job is Great Commission. I shouldn't be doing all discipleship. We should be doing all discipleship. It's not as hard as you think. It's not as hard as you think. I'm just asking you today, you're going to the gym this week. You're going to the gym. Could you post it on social media? Yo, go in the gym. Anybody want to go? Meet me at 5 o'clock. As you're going, take someone with you. Listen, you hate grocery shopping by yourself? Put it out there in a group. Hey, go on grocery shopping at 3 o'clock. Anybody want to go meet me at Hannaford? <coughs> Bam, you got a whole posse. Grocery shopping at Hannaford. <laughs> As you're going, bring someone along the journey with you. That's what this Great Commission is about. And then you know what happens? You know what I know happens? While we're doing something, while we're working out, while we're grocery shopping, while we're at the gun club, while we're playing cards, while playing dominoes. Hey, I got a question for you, P. Mike. You know when your kids were about 18, what did you do during, and all of a sudden, this opportunity to disciple comes up? I'm going through something in my marriage. How do I deal with this? An opportunity to disciple comes up. As you're going, disciple. Father, we thank you today that your word will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. I pray, God, today that there's a call in our hearts to take on life on mission. Life on mission. Help us to do that. If you're in here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, that's the starting point. He's the chief cornerstone to get this ball rolling, to be an example, to be a light. Without him, there is no teaching about him because you don't know him. Amen. If you're watching online or you're in the room and you never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd like to offer that to you today. Last Sunday, four people gave their life to Christ online. First service, four people gave their life to Christ right here in the room. If you're here today and you know that today is the day of salvation, today's the day to make that commitment to Christ, we'd like to pray a prayer with you. And because we love you so much, we wanna pray it out loud with you. And it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching online today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you type amen in one of our chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point so you can get started in your walk with Christ. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you for two seconds? Would you just wave at me and say, hey, that was me. I prayed that for the first time today. Anybody at all, real quick, as I look across the room, Anybody real quick? Yeah, I see you. Yeah, I see you. Anybody else real quick? Awesome. Great, great, great. That same devotional starting point is available at the Welcome Center to you. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't really know about Christianity or this guy with a two-tone beard. It's just kind of weird for me. Hey, we have a book at the Welcome Center called Welcome Home. It's a book about Christianity and what we believe here. That same prayer that we just prayed is at the end of that book, and that's our gift, our gift to you for free if you just stop and grab one at the Welcome Center. Father, we thank you today that we are blessed. We're blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like prayer, we have it available. We have counseling available as well, and our daycare opens tomorrow. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. 
you can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.